The average American's eating around 90 grams per day, males, females a little closer to 70, but around 90 grams per day, but they're eating 60% of it or more at dinner, 65. So they're eating approximately 10, 20, and 60 are how they distribute protein. So we basically said, we know that that first meal is critical, so let's just redistribute 90 grams, and we went 30, 30, 30. That happened to be even, <laughs> but the issue was we got 30 into breakfast. And what we found is with the exact same calories, the exact same protein, the exact same protein per day, we got higher level of daily protein synthesis just by moving it from dinner to breakfast. Hey everyone. Now, protein can be an emotional topic in the nutrition space. Ask two different doctors how much protein you actually need and chances are they'll come up with two different answers and they'll be extraordinarily passionate about their position. But look, protein is also a necessary topic. It is a building block of muscles and we all know that maintaining lean muscle mass is absolutely critical if you're serious about longevity. In this episode, we have Dr. Don Lehman, one of the world's leading protein and amino acid requirements researchers. Don is the guy when it comes to all things protein. He has spent over 30 years investigating the role of protein for muscle-centric health and has over 120 peer-reviewed research publications on the topic. So if you have any questions about protein, Don has you covered. Now look, we understand this is somewhat of an emerging area and more research is needed to say definitively how much protein you need, but bottom line, we think prioritizing protein is a good idea for your overall health span. Now to the show. Don, welcome. Glad to be with you. It is such an honor to have you on the show as you are one of the leading authorities, if not the leading authority on all things dietary protein and amino acids. So welcome. Well, thank you. <laughs> and though I'm familiar with your work, some of our listeners may not be. So maybe to start, can you fill us in about your background and the primary focus of your, of your research? So I have uh, degrees in chemistry, biochemistry, nutritional biochemistry. Um, you know, I was at the University of Illinois for 31 years. My research has been uh, sort of muscle centric. We are very interested in protein and basically metabolism in general and muscle, carbohydrate, fat, protein. But I'm particularly uh, interested in regulation of protein turnover, both synthesis and breakdown, and how amino acids are metabolized and their various roles. So that's kind of in a nutshell. I've studied uh, protein related to weight loss, related to muscle development, related to malnutrition, related to diabetes metabolic syndrome. So kind of relationships are protein to muscle development, but also relative to carbohydrate balances and insulin sensitivity. So that's kind of a, a breadth of my work. I, I did some malnutrition work in Africa early. I worked with the USAID on muscle development and growth stunting. It sort of all fits together as to where my sort of muscle centric concepts come from. And I think it's 120 peer-reviewed research papers. Is that yeah, numbers? yeah, in that range, yeah. Wow. And, and so, suffice to say, we're, we're going to have a very deep discussion today on all things protein and muscle. The two, the two are inextricably linked, and obviously, exercise is a component as well. But before we dive in, I am prepared for some people who are not going to be happy with this episode, and some people who will be happy. And and it's this idea that. Protein is an emotional topic. Why is that, in your opinion? Yeah, I often start my lectures when I'm out as saying, you know, protein is the most emotional topic. When did you ever have a drag out fight over vitamin C or, or something else? Um, you know, I think, you know, I think there are multiple reasons, but, um, you know, first and foremost, there's variety of people who think you just shouldn't use animals. So there's an anti-animal use issue. And it's very hard to have a uh, protein intake of 120 grams per day if you're vegan. So it's sort of like, 
well, I want to be vegan. I can't really reach that without all kinds of processed foods. So therefore, I have to make sure that that's not a theory. Uh, so that's one group. Second group is the food industry. The food industry makes money off of selling things in bags and boxes, highly processed grains. Uh, animal foods, but also fruits and vegetables are very low profit margin. They require refrigeration and they have relatively high storage. So they mostly go directly from the farm to the consumer. So nobody makes any money on them. So there's a negative there. And then the third one would be big pharma. Uh, as long as we have an anti-animal cholesterol saturated fat theory, we can sell drugs, statins, 90 million statin prescriptions a year in the U.S. And so, you know, there are three different lobbies that particularly have an anti-animal viewpoint. We've heard each of those, and now we sort of drifted into the climate one. So, you know, there's, there's a variety of anti-animal things that are all you know, quote, follow the money. That's where, that's where the animal, that's where the issues are. And hold, hold that thought of follow the money because we'll, we'll come back to the world of nutrition science later in the show. Um, but after establishing that, there is the link between protein and muscle. And before we get into muscle protein synthesis, why is muscle so critical as we age? Well, I think it's critical at every age. Uh, basically, muscle makes up close to 50% of your body, and it's a primary site for most of your glucose and fat metabolism. So obviously, it provides for functional mobility. If you can't get around, you couldn't find your next meal and you died. So muscle inherently, evolutionarily, was important. Uh, as we get older, um, it also is a major issue for things like insulin sensitivity, how we use glucose. It determines how many carbs you can actually use. We, I always talked about carbs as a carb threshold. You have to earn your carbs. Uh, and we could come back to that. But uh, it also is a primary user of fats. Muscle, actually, the primary fuel of muscle is fats. And in American society, where we eat a lot more carbs than fat, we're forcing it to use carbs and that's not a good thing. So muscle uh, is metabolically kind of a focus in the body. It's obviously for functional mobility. Uh, and it's, you know, it's such a large part of the muscle mass or body weight uh, in terms of composition. So, uh, and as we age, it all becomes less efficient. So it becomes more and more a priority of how we protect it. And you mentioned protection, and I think of the armor that muscle provides. I think of bone density and that really unfortunate statistic. Um, one out of four people over the age of 65 will fall. If you fall once, the chances of falling again double. And if you fall and break your hip, you have a 30 to 40% chance of dying within a year. I'll just pause there. And you think you run the numbers through your head, and that's terrifying. I just happened to look that up. Like yesterday, there's 300,000 hip fractures in the United States annually. <laughs> 300,000. The number of people, I mean, heart disease is the number one cause of death. But if you actually look at the statistics, the people who have actual heart disease is like 380,000. So there's almost as many people having hip fractures as having actual heart disease. Wow. And so if we can, you know, in terms of heart disease, I can go and get my calcium score and a ton of blood work and look at ApoB and LPA and all these, and all these things and, and, and get to assess my, my risk and to understand how, how well I'm doing, how well I'm scoring as I age with regards to muscle. How should one think about muscle mass and, and gain an understanding how well they're doing? And, and, and does that differ for a man versus a woman? I mean, two things that I always start with. I, I mean, you're, the question you're asking is important because we don't have as many clinical assessments that directly tell you. Um, three things I look at are 
you know, functional mobility. Can you get around well? You know, are you frail? Do you, are, can you move well? So that's, that's a starting point. From a clinical standpoint, two things I look for uh, are fasting blood glucose and triglyceride levels. If either of those are elevated, if you have fasting blood glu glucose above 110, if you have triglycerides above 145, your muscles aren't functioning very well. Either you're taking in too many carbs or you don't have enough exercise. Uh, triglycerides are such a great marker, we actually used it in our weight loss studies as a measure of compliance. Uh, if we start out uh, from whatever level of triglycerides people have, if we get them in the right carbohydrate to protein balance, they'll drop their triglycerides by at least 20%. And so if they don't maintain that, we know they're not following the diet. Interesting. And so I, I say we just go for it and cut straight to the chase with, with, with protein because th this, is, this, is, this is where all the controversy is. And so at the highest level, what do you think the number should be in terms of total grams? I'm going to say per pound, I, I, the, the kilogram, I, I know many researchers speak you think in, in terms of pounds. I, I, I never think that way, but go I ahead. Know, you, you all speak in kilograms and us civilians never think in, in kilograms. We think in pounds. So if I'm listening and I want to maintain or build lean muscle mass, how do you think about the total grams of protein I should be consuming on a daily basis per pound? Yeah, let's... Let's back up one step. I think thinking about protein and what's a high level is important. So um, this is an area you've thought about. What do you think is a high level of protein? What do, what do you think Americans are currently doing? And what do you think is a high level? Well, I, I know that we're not consuming nearly enough protein. I know that the RDA is kind of a joke and I want to hear, hear you talk about how we established the RDA. And I think it's safe to say that myself included and all of our listeners, if they are doing resistance training, it is a safe assumption that we are all probably not consuming enough protein. That is my take at the highest level. Okay. So um, with every nutrient, vitamin C, vitamin D, protein. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine established what are called dietary reference intakes. So for every nutrient, there's a range. For The range goes from the RDA, which is considered the minimum, and that's important for people to recognize. For some reason, we consider the RDA for protein to be the minimum, but also the maximum. <laughs> uh, but that's the minimum, and it goes to some upper limit where we could actually detect some level of toxicity or, or damage. Um, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin A, we all have ranges for those things. Uh, vitamin C, we know that 60 milligrams prevents scurvy, a deficiency, but people routinely take 500 milligrams for their immune response or if they're getting cold or worried about COVID or something. So much higher. With protein, the RDA is 0.8 grams per kg, sorry. Uh, and the upper limit is something above 2.5 grams per kg, which is uh, more than a gram per pound. So there's an upper limit. Um, the average American is taking in 0.9 to 1. So we're at the very bottom of the range. That's kg. That's kg. Kg. Yeah, I think that's around 0.4 grams per yeah, pound. And, and I think I think the RDA, if we were to equate to pounds, is 0.36 grams per pound of body weight. And, and so and Americans are like 0.42 or something. And I apologize for thinking in metric. <laughs> I appreciate all researchers and, and scientists like like yourself do. I'm just trying to translate for the I'm audience. Bring myself a cheat sheet so I can, and I forgot to do that this morning. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so those are the ranges we think of. I was going to mention that of women over the age of 65 in the United States, 40% are below the RDA. 
So women in particular are very close to the absolute minimum. Uh, and that, you know, that translates into around 60, you know, depending on body size, 50 to 65 grams per day, 40% are below that number. I mean, that's really striking. It is striking. And you know, when we think about the RDA, my understanding is the, the RDA was established as a bare minimum. And this is someone who, just, just to survive. And I don't think any of our listeners want to survive. They want to thrive. And so how was this even established? Is it just, just a couple people in a room saying, let's decide the number and, and here it is? It's very historical. Uh, and I sc- sort of skipped your, your question earlier about what should we be targeting. We can get back to that. Uh, the idea is kind of historical. Uh, most of it developed around World War II when the United States was confronted with feeding literally millions of fighter, war fighters overseas. How much food did they have to supply? So they basically said, you know, the best scientists, he said, give us some minimum requirements, give us some RDAs that we have to be able to develop food for. Protein actually even debate dates back a little further than that to really around 1900. And animal scientists basically realized that for animals to grow well and efficiently on farms, they needed to get the protein right. Uh, and so they needed ways to measure it. And so they basically developed things that were related to nitrogen retention. When you're growing, you can measure nitrogen uh, because they accumulate nitrogen. So we got the concept of nitrogen balance. And that was important because at that point, we didn't even know all the essential amino acids. All the essential amino acids weren't even discovered until around 1940. And so we started with protein needs, protein requirements, based on nitrogen balance. And we've been sort of stuck with that ever since. Uh, It works really quite well with growth with children, but it it absolutely doesn't have much to do with adult health. Uh, Most of the data about the RDA is with uh, college age guys. It's with 20, 25 year old males. Uh, And so how does that relate to a 60 year old female? probably not much at all. And what we've learned in the last 20 years is that as we get older, as we get beyond 40, uh, and you know we're sort of in a more downward trajectory on the aging curve, uh, we know that we become far less efficient with protein. We're becoming inefficient with how we handle it. And so the requirements begin to go up. Uh, you know, as a child, Protein requirements for in the first two years are 2.2 grams per kg. As I mentioned a little earlier, the highest level that we recommend in the range is 2.5. So that's basically children are right at the top. By 14, it goes down to 0.8, but the evidence for that is all based on nitrogen balance. It's not based on any metabolic outcomes. So the question is, why does it actually go down? You're still growing. I mean, why does it go down? (laughs) And there's not a good answer to that. I think that it's because nitrogen balance is misleading. And so we're going to come back to kids, but just to to establish the baseline here, if the RDA is 0.36 grams per pound, I'm going to pounds, I I got the math in front of me, suffice to say, you think, and you're not alone in this, that if you're looking to maintain muscle, maintain lean muscle, you should probably double that in, in the 0.7 range. And if you're looking to build muscle, you should probably, it's close to triple, trying to get close to a gram per pound. The range that the science, for, first of all, it's important to realize that our methods aren't super sensitive. Um, so again, trying to use your numbers, and I could get these slightly wrong. Uh, so the RDA of point. Three six, we we and a lot of other people use double that, so about 0.75. We think that is a very healthy target range, um, and me- and from a method standpoint, we can tell the difference between those two. Um, 0.36 versus 0.45, we can't tell the difference. 0.60 versus point eight zero. 
we can't tell the difference. Um, a gram per pound is what a lot of athletes use, and there may be multiple reasons, but the reality is we can't tell the difference, and now I'm going to switch back to kgs, 1.8 to 2.2, so that's approximately uh, 0.2. 75 to one gram per pound, you know, I'm switching these numbers back and forth. Uh, we can't actually tell the difference in those two. So what you have is exercise people have traditionally used around a gram per pound. In a laboratory sense, we can't tell the difference from 0.8 grams per, K, per pound. And does that differ between men and women? It's per pound. Um, so that accommodates a lot of it. Uh, that's a great question. Protein requirement should relate to lean mass. Uh, and typically we don't know that. So we use body weight and then people say, well, is it overweight or obese? We always use ideal body weight uh, for those numbers. Uh, if they're in weight loss, we use the target body weight as the number. Uh, but your point is, uh, it's probably a little lower for women, uh, but we don't have any real data to back that up. We know it relates to lean body mass. Women have lower lean body mass, but they're also smaller in weight. That probably is enough to take into account just the fact they're smaller in weight. And to summarize again, safe to say whether you're uh, a man or a woman, double the RDA. So getting close to 0.75 grams per pound is, is probably where you want to be if you are serious about maintaining and building lean muscle mass, to summarize. So all of those numbers, I think, just get confusing. I think it's better to just think about protein is an absolute number. Carbohydrates, fat, those are percentages of calories, but protein is an absolute number. So your minimum requirement is somewhere around 55 to 60 grams per day. That's the absolute minimum for a, you know, a 155, 60 pound person. Uh, we recommend around 120 grams per day for healthy adults. We find from a metabolic standpoint, working predominantly with women, that if they get below 100 grams per day, they lose most of the benefits of protein. Glucose, fatty acid metabolism, glucose, insulin sensitivity, weight loss, satiety. So we think there's kind of a major marker at around 100 grams per day. So I'll use the example of me. I'm six foot seven, I'm about 205 pounds. If you compare me to another male, similar age, but who's 5'10 and 205 pounds, uh, assuming we have approximately the same uh, body fat percentage, you've got someone who's got significant, significantly more muscle mass than me. So my question to you, how would my protein needs differ from my friend over here who is nine inches shorter than me, but has significantly more muscle mass? The reality is, I don't know that we have a great answer to that. Uh, you know, most of the work is done relative to body weight. Uh, and you know, the, the, the difference between having 0.6 grams per pound or, or 0.9 grams per pound, we can't really measure that very well. Uh, so, you know, I think the daily amount, we, all of the data suggests that uh, around, you know, 0.75 to 0.8 is adequate for most everybody. Um, and then we get into meal distribution. How should you distribute it? But that amount seems to be pretty much okay for everyone. Uh, people can go to higher amounts, but it's pretty clear that more protein doesn't help you build more muscle. Once you get to around you know, that 0.75 grams per kg, uh, that's probably adequate. Then it, it relates more to your res resistance exercise and what you physically do than eating more protein. So we know that there is a, there's a, always a detectable difference between 0.75 and 0.35. We know there's a difference there. As you go above that, um, Data doesn't really support that there's a benefit. 
And just to put, put a hard line in the sand, if you will, it's still that 100 plus grams per day is where you want to be. Again, having worked with hundreds of women, uh, particularly associated with some, you know, slightly older adults and weight loss and body composition, that's the line we found that was really critical. And I think that's, you know, all these grams per kg and stuff, I think people just find confusing. I basically put a hard line in the sand. You know, if you're worried about general health, you should be above 100. Uh, if you're an athlete uh, that weighs 200, and 50, you know, 200 plus pounds, you're probably going to want to be in the 160 range. You know, so I like the real numbers. I think they give people much more, quote, meat to sink their teeth into. <laughs> so do I, because when I started to become aware of, of the data and conversations like the one we're having, I started to think about what I'm eating and I'm saying, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Like, I, I can't, <laughs> I can't consume enough. And I start to look at body weight and I ask, ask the very question uh, about my height and weight. This is this is impossible for me. So I do think it is much easier, even though I think we've established double the RDA, which is like the call it the 0.75 grams per pound per body weight. If you want to be more precise, but this idea if you want to be north of 100, I think is a lot easier for people to wrap their heads around without becoming obsessive about this. The idea of how difficult it is, I usually start with talking with people about what do they eat in their large meal. So. Americans, that's typically dinner. What do you eat? Let's define how much protein's there. You know, six ounces of of meat at dinner is you know around forty grams. With a, you know some other things, plants and things, whatever you may eat, you might easily get fifty to sixty grams at dinner. Okay, so now what else are we going to do during the day? Uh, I think the first meal after you're coming out of an overnight fast is absolutely critical. So the one meal I get people to try and start thinking about changing is how can you get 30 to 40 to 45 grams of protein into breakfast? And once you sort of accomplish what is dinner and you accomplish moderating di breakfast, then you kind of have ta tackled the challenge. The rest of the day can kind of float along. So you leave me my next question in terms of distribution of protein. If we just, let's just settle on, say the, the 100 plus, is it an even split between breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Or it sounds like, in your opinion, breakfast is is king here, followed by dinner, and don't think so Doug much Hatton about lunch. Doug Jones and I did an experiment, which was really a cute design, but unfortunately got misinterpreted. Uh, we were looking at this distribution question, realizing that the average American is eating around 90 grams per day males, females a little closer to 70, but around 90 grams per day. Uh, but they're eating 60% of it or more at dinner, 65. So they're eating approximately 10, 20, and 60 are the, how they distribute protein. So we basically said, we know that that first meal is critical. So let's just redistribute 90 grams. And we went 30, 30, 30. That happened to be even, <laughs> but the issue was we got 30 into breakfast. Uh, and what we found is with the exact same calories, the exact same protein, the exact same protein per day, we got higher level of daily protein synthesis just by moving it from dinner to breakfast. Interesting. So w the thing to think about, a couple of pieces of information. Um, one is the body is constantly going through cycles that are anabolic and catabolic, uh, particularly muscle. The liver is different. The liver, in the middle of the night, the liver is making protein to regulate the body. And if it stops making protein, you die. And so, so where does the liver get amino acids for protein in the middle of the night? Well, it gets it from muscle. The body has no storage for amino acids, so it gets it from muscle. So that means muscle during the nighttime is catabolic. It's breaking down. And you'll go through 12 hours of fasting and it's breaking down. It's continuously breaking down muscle. You wake up in the morning and until you have a meal that triggers protein synthesis, and we can get into leucine and mTOR and all of that, but until you have a meal that triggers muscle protein synthesis, you'll stay catabolic. And for most Americans, that first meal is dinner where they're having 60 grams of protein. 
So that means a mer and and then the second part of that is after a meal you have an anabolic period, but it only lasts about two hours. And we could go into reasons for that, but it lasts about two hours. So that means you're spending the average American spending 22 hours in a catabolic condition for muscle and two hours after dinner in an anabolic. We think that is the aging phenomena that we know as sarcopenia. So that's why we want to get breakfast higher because we can now flip the switch back from being catabolic to anabolic and we can protect your muscles all day long. And so talking about sarcopenia and the anabolic versus catabolic, how does intermittent fasting play a role here for those, you know, waiting 16, 18, 20 hours as they age? And I, I've done this. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? So now you have two different goals in mind. The reason for intermittent fasting is to control calories. So presumably people who are doing it are, are struggling with weight. I mean, to me, that's the only re real good reason to do that. So you don't think there are longevity benefits to be... O only if you're arguing calorie restriction. Interesting. So if you don't have a problem with weight, if weight management is not an issue for you, you don't... So as far as I'm concerned, uh, the, the reason to do it is calorie control. I don't see any good reason to intermittent fast. And take it a little step farther, fasting in general, some people will say, well, that's for cleansing or all that. I don't think anyone over the age of 35 should ever fast. Because what we know is that if you're in your 40s, 50s, if you lose muscle mass, chances are you can't get it back. If you're in your 20s and you fast, that's pretty good because you're still pretty anabolic and you can gain it back. If you're in your 50s and you fast, just like bed rest or breaking, you know, having surgery, chances are that's a permanent loss of muscle. You might be able to do enough resistance exercise, but chances are you can't. And how do you define fast? Because there are many definitions of, of, of fast or intermittent fasting. For me, fasting is going beyond 24 hours without food. Got it. So 16, so call it 14, 16, 18. So time-restricted feeding versus intermittent fasting. Time-restricted feeding, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I, I frequently don't have my first meal till 10, 30 or 11. And I frequently have very little at a quote lunch period and then I'll have a dinner. So I'm 73. Uh, my calorie needs are down even though I exercise almost daily. Uh, it's just a way for me to balance my meals relative to my calorie needs. I think that's fine. First meal of the day, whenever it happens, make it high protein. Last meal of the day, make it high protein. In between, kind of what's your target? What's your calorie target? What's your protein target? Fill it in. And on that note, before we dive, dive into amino acids, specifically leucine, are there diminishing returns at a certain amount of protein per sitting? If I, if I go nuts and have 80 grams of protein, is that just useless? Is that dangerous? How do you think about that? Okay, so again, uh, two different effects. One is muscle, which is what we're talking about, and the other is whole body. Um, so if I have, so let's take the whole body concept. If I have uh, 200 grams, if I, if my uh, muscle target, as I mentioned earlier, is like 160 grams per day, uh, if I go to 200, I probably won't have any bigger muscles. But if I go to 200, I will have a bigger liver, kidney, and GI tract. So your lean body mass might get higher, but it really didn't help your muscles. Okay. So uh, let's say I lost track of where we were going with that. <laughs> Well, well, just how much can one consume? Is, are there diminishing returns? Yeah. So diminishing returns, definitely for muscle, but not so much for organs, okay? Uh, for muscle, uh, the minimum level people hear is 30 grams. Where did that come from? Well, what we know is that the, the trigger after that overnight fast is an amino acid called leucine which triggers a process 
by a there's a there's a master control switch called mTOR that triggers what we call the initiation phase of protein synthesis. So in, when we're sleeping at night, your muscle protein synthesis is running at kind of a basal level, but it's kind of turned down. You're still making enzymes, but you're not making any structural proteins to speak of. And so what we want to do is get back. And so when we have enough leucine at a meal, we turn on that that mechanism, okay, the mTOR mechanism. What we know uh, is that levels of leucine below two grams at a meal won't turn it on, and levels above two and a half grams will turn it on. And that's about as clear as we know. Okay, so 2.5 grams, the average American gets about 65% of their protein from animal-based proteins, about 35 from plant-based proteins. So if you use that, that says that the leucine content of foods would be about 8%, 30 grams, 8%, 2.5. That's where that number comes from. So we developed that. Uh, we know that the leucine trigger probably isn't maxed at that point, and it probably maxes at maybe 3.5. Uh, but as you pointed out, it's diminishing returns. So we get a very sharp rise from nothing to activated at 2.5, and then it begins to slowly plateau out. Uh, we think the range of protein for most people goes from about 25 to 65. Less than 25, you probably get no muscle effect. You get a liver effect. Liver will be fine, but you will get no muscle effect. And it probably maxes out 60 to 60 grams, maybe 65. Anything above that, again, you might get a liver effect, but you won't get a muscle effect. So in other words, if you're looking to maintain or build muscle, 30 grams of protein with at least two and a half grams of leucine is absolutely critical because if you don't meet that threshold, that protein consumption is, is, is since going to waste. Right. So, so for people looking to build muscle, we'd recommend at least four meals per day, each with a minimum of 30 grams of high quality protein. And that, so that gets you to 120. And high quality, you need the leucine. I think that's an important distinction. All protein is not created equal. Yeah. Here. So in whey protein, leucine is about 12%. So 23 grams of whey protein isolate will trigger it. Where if it's soy protein isolate, it's about 7.8%. So now you need 33 or 34 grams. So all proteins aren't equal. All animal proteins have higher leucine than all than all plant proteins. So again, the th the thing I always you know talk with vegetarians is that it's perfectly fine, but you have to realize you will always need more total protein, and that means more total calories to be equal. And the problem is, is most vegetarians go down in both. The average vegetarian intake in the U.S. is in the 60s, so it's basically low quantity and low quality. And that you can get by with when you're 30, but when you're 60, you can't get by with that. And on that note, when I first went through this process, I, I said, wow, I'm going to have difficulty achieving my protein needs given my age at 48. And I, I, I eat more plant forward. I'm an omnivore. I don't eat a ton of meat, but not on a daily basis. And so I went straight to, okay, I need to, to supplement here. You mentioned whey being a great source. You mentioned soy being a source, but you need to make sure you're, you have that right relationship between total amount of protein and leucine. What about creatine or other sources for those, or, or, or even sourcing, excuse me, supplementing with an amino acid complex? And how do you think about this in general? Um, okay, so creatine is a different kind of supplement. Um, in fact, we don't even really know the mechanism of that, but it's not a protein or amino acid. It's it's a molecule for, for muscle. For for muscle, I think I think goal is gaining muscle. It yeah. clearly it has very beneficial effects on both muscle mass and strength. So that's a supplement that has great science behind it, even though we don't know the mechanism. But it definitely works. Um, let's get back to protein. You know, supplements. I mean, I personally use a protein shake in the morning with uh, protein isolates, usually a whey protein isolate. But in fact, 
I have a product that we sell that is a plant-based product. So, uh, you know, so I, I, I'm, I'm okay either direction, but you have to know how to do it. You have to get the right leucine content in it. Um, can you supplement leucine on top of it? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, and we often do that. So I've talked about getting breakfast right and getting dinner right. Uh, we often recommend that people, especially if they're trying to do weight control or, or having low protein diets, uh, that they might have a lunch with 15 grams of protein, but they can supplement branch chain amino acids on top of that. And you can make that lunch look like it's 30 grams. It's more about the leucine than the protein number. The 30 is really about getting the two. Uh, no, no, you don't want it to go that way. Uh, but the leucine is a trigger. So it's like turning on a light switch. You know, it doesn't matter how much electricity is coming into your house until you turn on the light switch. It doesn't matter. Got it. So in other words, translation, if you have 15, but you don't meet the two and a half leucine requirement, the 15 is, is at a loss. But if you have 15, but you trigger the leucine at two and a half, the 15 is a gain. So exactly. So the 15 isn't a loss. It'll benefit the liver, but it won't benefit the muscle. And so if you add in the leucine, and now you can benefit all of your organs, including your muscle, because you'll trigger that process. Does, will it eventually, is, so is a meal with 15 grams of protein and a gram and a half or two grams of leucine added the same as a, gra a 30 gram meal? Probably not, but it may be 85% as effective. And in terms of, and, and we're talking about leucine, are there other amino acids that are critical in promoting muscle protein synthesis? So as soon as you turn on protein synthesis, then you need all 20. So, you know, now we've turned it on and now the body's trying to put together amino acids to make a protein. And so now we need all 20. One of the things we did and some other labs showed is that if you just give leucine alone, you know, so you've got a fasted person or animal and you just give leucine, you'll turn on muscle protein synthesis, but it pretty quickly depletes all of the essential amino acids in the blood. And all of a sudden the body can't make protein anymore because it doesn't have the amino acids. So we know that the nine essentials are the critical ones. Uh, so you have to have those with it. So you'll see some supplements that have all nine essential. One of the things that we're studying right now is that all of the essentials are not equally essential, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Um, for example, uh, histidine is one of the nine essential. It has never been shown to be essential for an adult. People have studied it. People have tried to do it. Uh, we know that it's essential in infants where you're dealing with formulas and things like that is their only source of food and they're growing rapidly, but no one's ever been able to show it's essential in adults. Why? We think it's because the way the body breaks it down, the way it oxidizes histidine is so slow, it takes forever to deplete the body of it. So it's essential, but it's not equally essential to leucine, which is a critical signal and very rapidly oxidized in the body. So we've got two very different amino acid patterns for the two, quote, essential amino acids. Interesting. And what about timing? We've all heard the, you've got to take advantage of that, that, that window you have right after a strength training workout. What's your take on that? Fact or fallacy? Actually, my take is that we were the first to show it. So we were actually the research lab that demonstrated that. So uh, we've studied it at some length. Um, the issue is all of that relates more to untrained individuals than it does to trained. Uh, if you just start training from zero, you're going to go into a fairly catabolic period during that training. And so the quicker you can recover from it, the more likely you can get hypertrophy. So we showed that there was sort of a window of two hours after exercise. Research by others, Stu Phillips and various other people have shown that if you're well trained, it probably doesn't make any difference. If you're an athlete and you're eating four times a day, 
whenever you have your exercise, the next meal is close enough that that's fine. So the idea that, you know, these guys going into the gym and they're pumping iron and as soon as they put down the last barbell, they're drinking some, that's just ridiculous. That's not useful at all. <laughs> and on that note, what, what happens if, if you are doing resistance training and, and, and you're, you're pushing yourself and you're doing everything as you should, but you're not having enough protein? What, what does that mean for you in terms of maintaining your lean muscle mass or gaining muscle mass at any benefit if, if you are still are doing the weight training but you're just not getting adequate protein yeah so that gets us back into what actually is the adequate and optimum um so if you're um if you're trying to do muscle hypertrophy muscle strength um you yeah. know, Stu Phillips, Lane Norton, and I talk about these things a lot. Uh, we would all agree that hypertrophy is 75% resistance training and 25% protein intake. You know, it's it's heavily weighted to the training. If you, if you want to gain muscle mass, you're going to do that in the gym. You can't eat, you can't eat your way into more protein. Okay. You can't eat your way to more muscle. Exactly. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. My mind's catching up here. At what level do you prevent gains? Uh, I think most people would probably argue if you start getting down into, um, we said the RDA is, you know, uh, 3.6. If you start getting down into the 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5 range, chances are you're going to prevent gain. And that is, is that per kg or per pound? Per pound. Um, so if you start getting down below 100 grams per day, chances are you're going to minimize your ability to gain. If you're taking in 160, is 180 different? No. So again, you know, resistance exercise is a starting point. If you have a really bad diet, it can prevent it. But protein's not a magic thing. It 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 supports it. You have to have it. You have to have it above what normal people are eating, um, but it you know muscle doesn't you know you can't make it grow. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that. I think I've come around in my wellness journey. I, I used to repeat the phrase all the time: "You can't exercise your way out of a bad diet." And in some regards, that is true. But I've become such a believer in the power of exercise and strength training as n of one personally i've seen such a huge difference and i track everything my hrv my resting heart rate the 28 vials of blood i do twice a year looking at looking at all things i anecdotally again n of one i looked at myself six months ago and i'd recently did labs uh, where i was eating a lot better. We had recently moved to Miami, so I've been enjoying going out to restaurants and, and probably having more French fries than I, sh than I should, but I've been exercising a lot more and doing more cardio. And my blood work was significantly better. And I was shocked. Yeah. I, you know, I think your comment about you can't eat your way out of a bad diet. Again, we need to think about the range of application here. So, you know, I think that phrase came from really bad diets. I mean, if you're if you're trying to be an, an elite athlete and your basic diet is French fries, pizza, and beer, chances are you're not going to perform at the best. Hundred percent, and and I, I am not I, I'm not eating McDonald's and Burger King. You know, to me, it's a little bit more sushi, more grass fed burgers with fries. You know, an extra beer here and there. So, I mean, there's a standard joke is that athletes have the most expensive urine in the world is because they they way over supplement. So once you go from having a lousy diet to having a good diet with reasonable protein and calories balanced, that's fine. You know trying to over supplement and do all kinds of strange things with your diet isn't going to make you a better athlete or make your muscles better or healthier. You know, what we're trying to do is get to a healthy diet. And, and you know, people will ask me, well, how about plant-based diets? Well, the problem is we already have a plant-based diet. We get 70% of our calories now from plant-based foods, and it's an awful diet. You know, 55% of those calories come from added sugars, oils and hydrogenated fats, and another 35 come from refined grains. So over 80% of our plant-based calories are pure crap. 
And so the issue is every nutritionist who's any good said, oh, sure, we should have more broccoli and green beans and asparagus and avocados. But that's not what Americans eat. They eat French fries and tomato sauce and lettuce, which have absolutely no nutritional value. So, you know, let's come to grips with what a healthy plant-based diet is. And you can be a perfectly healthy omnivore with very good plant-based diet. It's not either or. Well, I think that's an important distinction. I think the word, the term plant-based has totally been hijacked by, by big food. Uh, before we get to, to fake meat, which we will get to, you know, Oreos are plant-based. There are a lot of processed foods that, that you could say are plant-based. And I think traditionally, we, one would think of plant-based as in I'm eating whole fruits and vegetables. I'm shopping the perimeters. And now everything is plant-based. I mean, when a nutritionist hears the word plant-based, we get a certain picture of you know, all these green and yellow and vegetables and fruits. And, and when the average person applies a plant-based, what they're doing is Oreos and breads and, and you know, breaded products and all kinds of junk. <laughs> so on that note, you know, I do want to touch on, on fake meat. For someone who does lean plant-based, if you will, and, and maybe is opposed to, to having a grass-fed burger or, or fish, or, or maybe they just don't enjoy it, but, but they want to meet their protein needs. C can fake meat help fill the gap for them or, or no? Is it just... I think that we ought to separate out the concept of fake meat versus plant healthy plant proteins. So are, you know, beans and lentils and and edamame and you know unprocessed foods good for you absolutely they are is fake meat with 25 different chemicals most of which aren't fda approved we have no idea their health uh risk is that better for you wow i don't think so <laughs> you know so i we get into the ultra processed form versus the natural form uh i'm all for you know, beans and lentils. I The problem you get into with the plant-based proteins is you almost always have a high carb to protein ratio. Most plant, most beans, for example, have a three to one or four to one carb to protein ratio. So if you're going to eat 100 grams of protein with black beans, you're going to get over 300 grams of carbohydrates. Uh, if you're physically active, that might be okay, but most adults can't tolerate that. So in general, when I'm talking to people about it, I tell people that beans are an incredibly good carbohydrate source, but kind of a marginal protein source. And, and so, you know, nuts are another um, protein source, a nice protein source, but it probably has a high, it has a four or five to one fat to protein ratio. So you're always dealing with more total protein need and more total calories to go with it. So again, I think plant-based people need to think about some of the plant, you know, the isolated proteins, whether it's soy or pea or some of those kinds of things. They, they almost need to think about supplements. And to our earlier point, they definitely need to be involved with resistance exercise. Resistance exercise, interestingly enough, actually kind of lowers your protein need. It makes the protein, it makes that mTOR system more efficient. Interesting. How so? So the mTOR system has, so now we can go back to children too. The mTOR system has four signals in muscle. One is the leucine signal, how much protein you're eating. A second one is hormones, insulin, IGF-1 growth hormone. Third one is energy, ATP. And the fourth one is stress, uh, particularly resistance exercise, a molecule known as RED1. And so when those four signals are correctly balanced, uh, mTOR gets triggered. When you're young and growing, that system is heavily uh, responsive to insulin, growth hormones. Uh, once you stop growing, you get into your 30s, now it switches over that insulin's not really a growth factor and it becomes sensitive to leucine. And so the issue is leucine's to trigger. What we know is if you're sedentary, then basically the leucine needs get even higher. But if you're doing resistance exercise, 
uh, it actually makes it more efficient at recognizing the leucine. Interesting. So the more active we are, theoretically, you don't have to, you still focus on the, the you call it the, the, the hundred, the hundred per day or 120 per day you need to make sure you're getting that two and a half plus per 30 grams, but you'd be less maniacal about it if you're quite active. And so, so now again, once again, we get into nuance. So is your goal to be an elite athlete and gain muscle, or are you trying to be a healthy adult? If you're being a healthy adult, then the exercise helps you lower your protein need. It helps it make it, you're more efficient. If you're trying to be an elite athlete, then you probably need more. We know that uh, aerobic exercise burns about 10 grams of protein per hour. So if you're working out three hours per day, that adds 30 grams of protein on top of whatever you thought your need was. Interesting. We always have to sort out, are you talking about weight loss? Are you talking about normal health? Or are you talking about elite athletes? They're very different cases. I think it's safe to say that myself included, and most of our audience is probably interested in maintaining and maybe building slightly lean muscle mass so that they are strong as they age, uh, they, they have a little bit of that, ar- that armor, uh, they're lean, and that's what they're really focused on. And maybe they want to be great at pickleball like me, but- I'm a tennis player, yeah. <laughs> okay, God bless you, too much running for me. Yeah, no, I get it. My knees tell me that too, so I get that. But you know, I think, I think the way I start with people is that, for example, assuming your audience might be mostly female, we try and get them above 100 grams per day and then tell them to get to the gym. They have to have resistance exercise. And that might be yoga and Pilates. It's about stretch. It's not about how many barbells you lift. Uh, it's about stretch. But if you want to build your strength, maybe build some tone, maybe build some muscle, you've got to get to the gym. You've got to do something to get that stretch and resistance. And so bringing you back to mTOR, which we've talked about numerous times, but but let's spend a, a moment there. Some some will say, specifically Walter Longo, we've had on the show, uh, you know, he'll make the argument, high, low protein uh, mTOR is where you want to be if you're optimizing for longevity or say health span. Um, and I know you don't agree. Um, and can we just spend a moment here talking about how you think about the argument or case here with regards to low versus high protein um, and the role of mTOR and your take. Let's think about where that theory comes from. Uh, we've known for, since I was in graduate school, so for 40 plus years, that calorie restriction increases longevity in rodents that live in sterile cages. And if you step back from that, uh, what we also know is that rodents that live in sterile cages and never experience any trauma or stress also overeat. They overeat by about 40%. So we can then begin to restrict. And and in fact, you can go into a, a, a rat living in a cage with food 24 hours a day, and they eat 24 hours a day. You can open up their stomach and look, and they will have food in their stomach 24 hours a day. They're absorptive. So back to the mTOR, that means mTOR is turned on 24 hours a day, okay? Now, if we begin to restrict them in calories, and at the University of Illinois, uh, we had decided that a 40% restriction normalized the rat. 40% restriction. <laughs> That's a pretty big restriction. 40% restriction made them normal. In other words, we know that obesity shortens longevity. So now what we're doing is normalizing them and they live longer. That makes sense. One of the other things that happen is when we restrict their food, now they will eat it when it's presented to them, and then fast the rest of the day. Uh, So now we've changed them to meal feeding. So that's what we want to do with protein. You've never heard me say you should eat protein and little meals all day long, 24 hours a day. What we want to do is turn mTOR on and let it turn off. 
meals. That's why we eat protein in meals. Longo's data is all about abnormal animals. Basically, ad libitum fed, they overeat, mTOR is always on, and it obviously changes you know, their lifespan and makes them more prone to cancers and things like that. Um, the other piece of data he has is from epidemiology. So basically, they'll go out and do a food record on a person and 35 or 40 years later, they'll look at how they died and they say, well, that's what caused it. Um, I don't know of any Americans who eat the same diet for 40 years every day. So basically, when you see the epidemiology, one of the things that people point out is, well, protein caused X or Y, but they ignore the fact that the, the, the food pattern makes a difference. And so <clears throat> people who eat all of their protein at fast food restaurants are vastly different than you and I who eat protein with very healthy diets. And so that's the other piece. Um, if you look at epidemiology statistics, um, protein is something we can get a hard statistic on. If I ask you how many eggs you ate yesterday, you'd give me the exact number. If I ask most people uh, how much beef they had yesterday, we eat it by the ounce. I had a quarter pounder. I had a six ounce steak. If I ask you how many glasses of milk you had, I, well, I had eight ounces. But if I ask somebody how many carbs they ate yesterday, well, I had a bag. <laughs> I had a box. <laughs> I had a pile. <laughs> it was pasta in a bowl. Um, they, they have no clue. So when you see somebody saying protein causes something, what you want to do is substitute the word carbohydrates, and then you'll have the real answer. So, so to unpack that, it sounds like, with regards to the the the, the rat study, uh, the rodent study, not a good comp because humans don't eat twenty four seven, but rats do. the 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 better way to do this, if you were looking at a rat who ate three to four meals a day, and then you could draw potentially a better conclusion because because that's the the comp. We're looking at. If you look at all of the research that I've published, you'll find that every one of our mechanistic animal studies is always meal fed. That's what makes our research totally different than everyone else's. Most researchers, either because of their situation or because their graduate students simply won't do it, they just allow the animals to eat whenever they want. We fed them very specifically, just like humans eat, three meals a day, specific time, specific amounts. And when you do that, you find that they resemble humans quite a lot. So people will say, well, rodents don't look like, or, you know, they're not small humans. Well, that's true, but metabolically, they act very much like humans if you treat it correctly, if you feed them the same way humans eat. And everyone likes rodent studies because you can control the environment, which segues to the, the problem with epidemiology studies to, to and yeah we know everything that they ate we can make isocaloric we can make it exactly the same food uh, we can control their exercise I, and and at the end of the day with humans we're sort of stuck with dexa and lean body mass which is liver and guts with animals we can actually take out the muscle and determine whether the muscles actually are different or not and so we know they are and on the subject of studies, look, nutrition science is so confusing and just ripe with conflict for, for a, a myriad of reasons. Can you, can you talk a bit about you know, how it works in terms of funding and nutrition science and conflicts of interest, which I know you've been asked about, and, and sort of the catch-22 here? It's kind of an easy cop-out that if you hear somebody say something you don't like, then the first thing you do is, well, they're paid for by X, Y, or Z, some industry, you know. But the reality is food research has to be paid by industry. NIH, the primary funding for metabolic research, studies disease. They have no interest in studying food. If I said I wanted to study uh, exercise performance or I want to study I, I sent in research grants to NIH for 10 years to study the leucine question, which we now know has revolutionized our way of thinking about protein. And the review that kept coming back, they, they, they did not fund my grants. And they said, well, 
we don't know of any diseases related to proteins, so therefore it's not fundable. I finally ended up having to go to Kraft, uh, the National Dairy Council, uh, the Beef Board, groups that actually had an interest in protein, and they funded the research. Um, we showed the leucine effects, and that really has become the standard of how we understand protein. Uh, you know, did I think that beef and dairy were good proteins? Absolutely, I did. That's why I asked them. Uh, does that make the research false? Well, 20 years and 100 labs have studied it and have proved it true. So my comment to people is, if you see something in a headline about nutrition, don't believe it. Uh, when you see it repeated in two to three more independent laboratories, start believing it. And how does that work in the process if you know one receives a grant, whether it's from the egg board or the beef board versus you know a General Mills or a Coca-Cola, assuming you're able to, to do the study and share the findings, is, are, are, there, are there studies that you know, we, we never see because the findings weren't aligned with a point of view? Or how, how does that work, just to give people an idea of this process? There are always studies that you don't see. Um, I probably published one out of three studies that I ran in my life. My attitude was until I repeat it at least once, if not twice in my own lab, I'm not going to publish it. Um, so again, there's lots of studies that get done. Um, you mentioned some great groups. So let's sort, sort out the difference between um, the egg board uh, and, and Coca-Cola. Uh, the egg board is a commodity group under the jurisdiction of the USDA. The USDA monitors the grants. It monitors how the grant programs are done. And it makes sure that the commodity never sees the publication. Basically, the investigator can choose to when and where to publish, and they have no responsibility of giving it to the egg board until after it actually appears in print. On the other hand, the, the commercial groups, Kellogg's, Coke, Pepsi, they can require you to show your data to them at every step along the way, and they have veto power over whether you publish it. So again, not a level playing field. Interesting. So it sounds like when you are looking at a study that's subsidized from a commodity-based industry, whether it's beef, eggs, or avocados, or whatever, uh, probably better than looking at one subsidized by big food or pharma. Yeah. You know, if, if Coke is doing a, a study about sugar, you probably want to think about that. If you, you know... If, you, if you're watching the Dairy Council do a study about milk, um, chances are it's pretty fair. You know, it's going to be it's going to be an honest study. Uh, people say, well, you're biased. I mean, let's let's be honest here. I mean, we all eat. Uh, every researcher eats. And I don't know if any researcher says, wow, I have a really crappy diet and I'm going to study that. You know, it's sort of, you know, we all believe that our diet's healthy. So we inherently start with a bias. On that note, getting back to, to studies, if I understood correctly, it sounds like you don't really pay attention to a study unless it's been repeated. Otherwise, it's potentially just a flash in the pan. I never pay attention to things in the news just because I know they're they're sensationalized. If it goes through an editor, chances are it's not true. <laughs> and so, you know, I look for the original research. So I will say, okay, here's somebody who has a new paper. I'll go read it. And then I'll say, do I know of any other labs that have done this? And if I don't, I'll just keep it in the back of my mind till I see another. Uh, I basically never read newspapers or or review articles i want to see the original research i want to see whether the research design could actually prove the point was it well done how was it reviewed i want to see the actual facts and then i make up my mind i don't want somebody else's opinion so building off of that we do live in a world where studies with sensational headlines get media attention and i, I understand why are there studies out there that in your opinion are significant, but just aren't getting the attention of the media because for, for one reason or another? Wow, that's a great question. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, I, all of mine, 
<laughs> well, the, well, we could, we could, we, well, we we could talk about yours, and if others come to mind as well. But there's a reason why you're on the show because you, you you've got 120 peer reviewed papers. So I think there has been. Uh, let's back up just a little bit in years. Obviously, we're in a period where where cholesterol kind of dominated the news for years. We got the food guide pyramid. It was all about avoiding cholesterol, and that was proved to be wrong. So we had basically a 40-year period where we got Snackwell cookies and Crisco margarines and all kinds of junk that were all based on cholesterol was bad for you. We know that's not true. Um, we're also now dealing with the issue that, well, too much protein is not good for you. It shortens longevity. It causes cancer or saturated fats cause heart disease. We need to come back to grips with the research that says, well, protein doesn't actually cause cancer. Uh, the epidemiology is not very good. There's some great studies that have gone back and looked at that. And, you know, people don't like to hear it. We know that saturated fat um, really isn't that bad. In fact, the only fat, I mean, the body makes fats. The only, body, the only fat the body actually can make is palmitate, which is a saturated fat and considered the most unhealthy. But after a million years of evolution, the body only makes that one. So if it's really toxic, we should all be dead. The issue is amounts. And so what Ron Krauss and Jeff Folick and others have shown is that saturated fats really aren't bad unless you're eating too many calories. If you're obese then you pro and, and planning to stay obese, then your choices of fats probably make a difference. But if your goal is to be healthy, uh, we know there's a lot of data about keto and other kinds of things that the amount of saturated fat really isn't that bad. Um, I'm not a person who thinks you should have lots of fat, but I definitely am a person who thinks the saturated fat story is way overtold. Uh, if your calories in check, your carbohydrate and insulin are in check, your saturated fat number really doesn't make much difference. And so th this goes back to the the problem with epidemiology studies if if you know, referencing someone who's, who's eating a lot of meat but it's they're they're likely consuming you know fast food burgers with fries and sodas thus calories carbs insulin everything you just mentioned also out of whack but we're just paying attention to the one thing over here protein and meat yeah i mean what we know is from 1975 till today beef consumption has gone down 40% 40% drop, and yet heart disease really hasn't changed. Cancer really hasn't changed. Obesity and diabetes have skyrocketed. So blaming, using the epidemiology from 30 years ago to blame beef, it just doesn't stand up. It's just not. Wow, so it's really 40%, meat consumption has gone down 40% percent 40% per capita in the U.S. Wow, yet heart disease, cancer still climbing. We have 90 million people taking statins in the United States now, which statins came on the market in 1990. So, I mean, we have a massive issue with heart disease, but you can't blame beef for it. We can blame calories. Um, the number one source of saturated fat now is cheese. Uh, number two, I believe, is hydrogenated oils, frying oils. So, so is that, do you blame the highly processed seed oils for cardiovascular disease and, and cheese, or, or, or is it calories, or is it fast food? I blame obesity for uh, heart disease and cancer and diabetes and obesity. I blame calories uh, and highly processed foods uh, allow you to eat more calories. And obviously oils and carbs, refined oils and carbs become a very convenient way to overeat calories. And so in your view, is the problem of the highly processed food the processing of it, or is it the bad highly processed oils, or is it the notion that it leads you to eat more, thus increasing calories, or is it all of the above? I think there's parts of all of it. You get into a lot of nuances. I mean, uh, processing of oils, trans fats. We know trans fats are bad for you. You'll see a lot of products that say that they're trans fat free. Well, as long as the label has less than 0.5 grams per serving, 
they can say they're trans fats free. So they're not really trans fat free. They've just changed their serving size so they look like it. Okay, so processed oils, are there problems? Probably. We know that oils that are overcooked, so in deep fat fryers and restaurants that are continuously overheated, that those are problems. Um, processing, does processing make it unhealthy? We know what it does do is the foods are designed to be uh, very uh, appetite appealing. Uh, what was it, Frito-Lay said, I bet you can't eat just one, <laughs> and hence we are obese. Uh, you know, I think that we need to recognize that high processed foods, low fiber, uh, not a natural structural food form, tends to overeat that. And so how do you define a healthy diet? If you're, if you're riding the elevator with someone and they, and they say, what do you do? Well, you know, I'm actually in nutrition science and, and say, well, well, hey, hey, doc, what, what do I eat? How, how do you describe a healthy diet in, th in 30 seconds or less? I know that's a tough one. On Twitter, every time I wait, Every time I wade into Twitter, somebody's asking me a question that requires an hour answer, and I've got what four hundred words. <laughs> well, my, uh, minus the anger, vitriol, and 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 subsequent hate. Fortunately, I don't get too much of that, but you know, it depends on how you tre tread your way into it. Um, you know, I I think you know what my grandmother said. 50 years ago about eating a variety of unprocessed foods and eat your vegetables is, is great advice. I, I think that having a varied diet, you know, having a colorful diet, eating vegetables, eating colorful fruits, um, you know, that's, that's how we always organize when we talk to people. Um, I, we have a way when we do our weight loss studies, uh, we basically divide the plate into three uh, sections. And so front and center, we say, make your protein choice. You can be vegetarian, you can be omnivore, I don't care, but make it because that determines everything else. Then you make your uh, next choice about vegetables and berries, high fiber fruits and vegetables, not bananas, uh, you know, not orange juice, but natural fruits, high fiber forms. And then your third section is what we call carbohydrates. And that's all of the breads and rices and pastas and uh, quinoas and even beans and things like that that are high carbohydrate. And what we tell people is your protein section in volume or your carbohydrate section can never be larger than your protein section. So if you have a six ounce piece of, of meat, that means your carb section can be, never be more than a half a cup. And so you mentioned no bananas. Why no bananas? Bananas are uh, 35 grams of pure sugar with essentially no other nutrients unless you eat the peel. Got it. Okay. Okay. And it's pretty, and it's basically all fructose if you don't like fructose. And so we touched on kids briefly. I want to come back to kids. Uh, how do they differ? in terms of their needs and frequency? If, if we've established the, the 100 grams plus, the 30 and the two and a half in terms of protein and leucine per meal, talk about kids, that's a concern for me. I've got a six-year-old and, and a three and a half-year-old. And ever since be, becoming familiar with your work, my wife and I have been maniacal about they need their protein. Yeah, so you know, teaching them to eat vegetables uh, early, uh, keeping track of how many snacks they eat is great. Uh, the thing we were talking about earlier about the regulation of mTOR, so when you're a child, uh, you're basically dominated by hormones. You're going to grow, you know, internationally, you can look at African countries, you're going to grow in spite of a lousy diet. It's just a survival characteristic. And so what we know is that for a child, having a breakfast with 8 or 10 grams of protein They'll grow perfectly fine. They can have a lunch with 10 grams of protein. They don't seem, children and basically individuals under 25 don't seem to be very sensitive to meal distribution. They just, it's a quantity per day. Interesting. So they can snack. They can snack all day, three grams of protein, five grams of protein, all adds up. Whereas us, us adults, no. Seems to work reasonably well uh, as long as the calories are in check and they don't become obese. <laughs> So, you know, what are those snacks? The problem when you go to snacks, um, 
the snacks that are available tend to be very high sugar, high carb, high fat, fat with low protein. You know, breakfast bars and things like that have two grams of of protein in 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 two hundred calories. So you know, those aren't good choices. We would like them to have you know ten, twelve grams of of protein. Um, one of the examples I always like to use, and you know, is um, you know, let's compare. Uh, a cereal. So let's take a wheat cereal that has four grams of protein. Uh, and you look on the label and it says, you know, a, a serving size is uh, three quarters of a cup. It has four grams of protein and you mix it with six ounces of milk. We now have 10 ounces, 10 grams of protein. Uh, and if you look at the amino acids, the wheat cereal is always deficient in an amino acid called lysine. And the milk is very rich in lysine. So that now makes what we call a complementary protein. So six ounces of milk with that cereal. But if you go to a soy milk, for example, it takes almost 30 ounces to balance the leucine number. So the child needs almost a quart of milk to balance that amino acid ratio. And that's what people aren't being told. If you look at almond milk, there's essentially no protein in it at all. Um, is like one gram per eight, per eight ounces. So you'd have to have something like a half a gallon to balance it out for the child. So the problem we have is that people are being told these plant-based things, but they're not being given enough information to actually balance it for children. For adults, probably doesn't make much difference. For a growing child, it does. And for a growing child, how do you think about the daily protein need? Is it a, in terms of per pound? Up until, so I think we mentioned earlier, in the first two years, it's 2.2 grams per kg. So that's a little above a gram per pound. Uh, it goes down, I think at, at 14, it's down to that 0.8. So, it, you know, there's kind of a transition across that. So for a 10-year-old, it's around one gram per kg is the RDA, which is the minimum number. Uh, so that would be uh, around... Uh, 4.5 or something like that grams per pound. But again, that's the minimum number. Uh, again, I like I like a number somewhat higher than that. So but would you pick an absolute number in the same way you have an absolute like 100, north of 100 for adults, for kids? or Children are changing weight so rapidly, you know, you can't really do an absolute number. You can't say, well, gee, uh, you know, all children should have 40 grams. I, I mean, you know, a, a two-year-old is very different than a 10-year-old. For, for example, call it a 50-pound child. Um, I'd have to think about the math. I don't, I don't do uh, child development that much. You know, I did a lot of malnutrition early in my career, but I can't do that off the top of my head. I mean, the, the requirement is one gram per kg. Got it. So that's essentially a third. It, it's almost- that's, again, the RDA. Got it. So my guess is it's probably going to come in or out. If, if it's a 50-pound kid, probably around, it's still going to get close to the one-to-one. -one. Yeah, it's still going to be around that 50-gram range would be, I think that's a pretty, you know, around a gram per pound is a pretty reasonable range probably. And you know, of all the, the research you've done, of all the studies, is there one that you're particularly proud of that has really stood the test of time in your opinion? I guess two that would come to mind. I mean, there's a lot of them that I think were useful. Um, I think the two that come to mind was in the late 90s, uh, uh, Tracy Anthony and Josh Anthony and Jim Jefferson and I were the first to basically make the connection that leucine stimulated the initiation factor in muscle. And that really led to the two decades of study of mTOR. We knew about mTOR, people knew it, but it was being studied in liver and other tissues. And we basically showed that uh, in liver, protein synthesis is regulated. There's, of these initiation factors, there's at least 12 of them. In liver, the dominant one is called EIF2. Uh, and we realized that couldn't be the regulation in muscle. And so we started looking at EIF4 and we made that connection. So that really has changed the game. Another one that I think is really useful is we did a human weight loss study. We did the first protein and exercise study where we did a two by two, where we looked at low protein, 
with and without exercise, higher protein with and without, without exercise. And what we showed was the exercise and protein are synergistic. They basically help you protect muscle and partition weight loss to body fat. Uh, in essence, what we showed was that the food guide pyramid, the high carb, low protein diet, actually minimize the benefit of doing resistance exercise. Interesting. So I think those, I think those two studies are pretty interesting. Um, we just did an interesting study with Suzanne Devkota, who's at Cedar sinai She was one of my students. She's now a professor out there. Uh, she's a microbiome expert. And one of the, one of the questions that I always had uh, was, why don't vegetarians show protein deficiency more than they do? You know, a lot of them are pretty low in protein, and yet they don't really exhibit a deficiency. And so my theory was is that we're changing the microbiome. And my theory was is that because they're vegetarian, they're eating fiber, and fiber would change that. Uh, and so we ran that study, and what we found was that when the – and we did it in animals – uh, when we fed the animals higher fiber diets and very low protein, the microbiome changed to make the gut look more like a ruminant cow, make it look like an animal. And basically, the microbiome then became efficient at scavenging nitrogen and it actually could make amino acids. And that was published in Nature about a year and a half ago. Fascinating. So there especially as we in the context of this conversation how it's difficult for vegetarians to get enough protein and, and maintain and build lean muscle mass that's and there's, very there's limits to it because the body can't make nitrogen but the issue is uh you can learn to recycle it out of your own gi tract and you can also take nitrogen that comes in in the diet one of the one of the things that cattle do for us this is a, a different experience. This is a different question, but uh, one of the things cattle do for us is they make essential amino acids. Uh, I like to ask my students, well, where do we get essential amino acids? And everybody says, well, you know, Whole Foods, right? Or a grocery store. I said, no, but where do they really come from? Uh, in nature, the only place we get essential amino acids is bacteria. And so the bacteria on the roots of plants will absorb nitrogen from the soil. That's why you fertilize your plant, nitrogen from the soil, and they make what are called organic amines. And those amines then in the plant can be made into amino acids. And that's cool. Plants make amino acids for us. The problem is they don't actually make it for us. They make it for themselves. And so they're making roots and leaves and stems and flowers, which are pretty different than hearts and brains and, and arms. And so what a cow does is it eats the plant and the bacteria in its stomach, in its rumen, can actually take all of that plant material, use the fiber and make the essential amino acids that we need. And that's why ruminant meats and dairy and things like that have become such an important part of human existence because we're using the cow to correct the diet. Well, it also makes the case, I think, for grass-fed cattle, grass-fed dairy over corn and soy-fed. Yeah, that's a nuanced sort of question, too. It's not as clear as, and I don't know how much you want to go into that, um, the, the issue is it gets into... Uh, you know, the quality and the grass fed definitely has somewhat of a different fatty acid content. But then people go into the climate change thing. And the problem with grass fed uh, is that uh, it takes a lot longer to come to market. And that when they're eating the grass and forage, they produce a lot more methionine and CO2. People, people say, well, the cow is belching up all this methionine. Well, it's not actually the cow, it's the bacteria that are fermenting the grasses. And so when you feed them corn uh, to finish instead of grasses, it actually reduces the, uh, uh, meth meth the methane emission about fourfold. So there's a trade-off there that grass-fed might be more healthy. Uh, it takes a lot longer to come to market and they actually produce more methionine while they get there. So you really have to 
be sure you understand those arguments before you make any conclusions about it. And well, we won't go into regenerative, the regenerative agricultural piece of this, because I, I think that it becomes even more nuanced. And my understanding is it does become beneficial for the, the environment. Sure. All of those things. I mean, you, again, you have to start with the fact that if we feed corn, about 7% of the corn grown in the United States goes to cattle and 40% goes to ethanol for cars and another 15% for high fructose corn syrup. So, you know, if you're if you're really going to get into the nuance of regenerative, you know, we need to stop uh, making sugar out of it. 100% agreed and we will not touch on high high fructose corn syrup today as we, that we, we are we are not fans suffice to say you're you're not a fan as well. Uh, I, I know we, we are way over time. Uh, Don, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. It was fun, fun chatting.